Okay, I think we can get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone attending and uh, joining us later for the recording. My name is Alexander Van Manjun. It is my pleasure to, prevent, to present this event of the fourth annual Modern Mind Network Conference on social provisioning and movement strategizing. We have a great panel today consisting of David, Matthew, and, Jeff, and Jordan, and they will be speaking in that order. Um, and we are going to kick everything off with David today. So David Stein is a UC President's postdoctoral fellow in the Department of African American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the author of the forthcoming book, Fearing Inflation, Inflating Fears, The Civil Rights Struggle for Full Employment and the Rise of the Carceral State, 1929 to 1986. He also contributed to the drafting of the 2021 House Resolution, HR 145, recognizing the duty of the federal government to create a federal job guarantee. And David, you can share your slides and uh, give your speech whenever you're ready. All right. Thanks so much um, to all the organizers of this, all the other panelists. It's really, um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so let me, is, is the PowerPoint showing now? So one of the most important goals of the civil rights movement was the quest for a federal job guarantee. Since the 1930s and 1940s, and through the rise of the modern civil rights movement, civil rights activists pointed out the deep disparities that resulted from economic recessions and how these magnified already existent labor market inequities. Civil rights activists called for a coordinated federal effort to attain full employment as a means of achieving a more fair and just economy. These efforts would help create the Employment Act of 1946 and the Humphrey Hawkins Act of 1978. The thrust of both laws was greater participation in monetary and fiscal policy decisions by the American people, as well as greater collaboration by economic institutions, including the Federal Reserve, to represent the public interest by achieving full employment, which in contrast to many of the ways that the term is currently used, for them meant a situation when everyone who wanted a job could find one at good wages with good working conditions and where they were located. So this call for full employment arose in the wake of the depression and the winding down of World War II. As many people looked out towards the end of the war, it was unclear whether a return to a peacetime economy would return all working people, especially women and communities of color, to the precarious economic conditions that they had experienced before. The war had demonstrated also that with political will, the government had a host of options available in manufacturing goods and services. In the mid-1940s, ideas about full employment enjoyed a broad consensus. It wasn't just civil rights activists or labor activists who argued for full employment. When Fortune magazine ran a poll in 1944 that asked, Quote, do you think the federal government should provide jobs for everyone able and willing to work, but who can't get a job in private employment? 68% of respondents said yes. This was an especially important goal for black workers. As a coalitional statement of leading black activists, including Thurgood Marshall, Sadie Alexander, and A. Philip Randolph wrote, quote, in evaluating the merits of parties and candidates, we must include all issues all the issues, those touching the life of black people as a group, as well as those affecting the entire country. The party or candidate who refuses to help control prices or fails to support the extension of social, social security or refuses to support a progressive public program for full post-war employment or opposes an enlarged and unsegregated program of government financed housing or seeks to destroy organized labor is as much the enemy of black people as he who would prevent black people from voting. For many constituencies, full employment was the key issue on the post-war agenda. So what happened? Well, the wide-ranging social consensus led to the introduction of the Full Employment Bill of 1945, which soon ran up against the racial and political constraints of Jim Crow America. The 1945 bill had emphasized that, quote, all Americans able to work and seeking work have a right to useful, remunerative, regular full-time employment. The bill passed the Senate 71 to 10 before being met by opposition in the House, 
where it ultimately faltered as a result of Midwestern Republicans and Southern Democrats. The power of these politicians, such as Carter Manasco and William Whittington, to derail that proposed full employment bill of 1945 was premised on Jim Crow voter exclusions. Let's take Manasco, for example. He was the chair of the House Expenditures Committee and hailed from Alabama's 7th District. Elections there often brought out less than 10% of the population. He presided over the home of Coretta Scott King's family in Perry County, as well as many of the pivotal sites of the future struggle for voting rights, including Selma and Birmingham. I think it's fair to say that in 1945, this district fell far short of anything resembling democracy. Seeking to maintain the racial, economic, and gendered structure of the region, Manasco opposed the bill on the grounds that farm workers and domestic workers might leave in search of more gainful employment. As a result, there were significant differences between the 1945 full employment bill and the eventual 1946 Employment Act. Proposals that established an, an affirmative right to full-time employment and a planning mechanism to achieve it were removed. But despite how the 1945 bill had its most transformative elements excised, the consensus for full employment was strong enough to pass the 1946 Employment Act. The 1946 Employment Act sought to establish more coherent economic planning in the interest of maximum employment. And the quest for full employment would evolve over the, over the coming decades. As A. Philip Randolph set out to organize the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in, the, in early 1963, the jobs component, component was at the forefront of his agenda. So much so that an initial name for the march was the quote, Emancipation March for Jobs. Although it's most remembered for Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech and its role helping elicit the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act of 1965, its central demand, full employment, has gone unfulfilled. This wasn't due to inadequate effort, but the challenges of achieving legislation. At the march, a number of the 250,000 in attendance held signs reading civil rights plus full employment equals freedom, a slogan that was conceptualized by Randolph himself. Many of those 250,000 people undoubtedly had read the organizing manual, which had emphasized that, quote, a massive federal jobs program to provide jobs for all the unemployed and federal legislation to promote an expanding economy. Unfortunately, these demands went unacknowledged by those who might be able to translate that vision into public policy. These struggles would continue over the following years as many, as many furthered the fight for full employment. Rustin and Randolph joined with left liberal economist Leon Kaiserling to propose a freedom budget for all Americans to reinvigorate the social welfare state. The freedom budget demanded guaranteed jobs or income for all, among much else. Well aware of the need to coordinate economic policy institutions, the freedom budget also emphasized that, quote, more effective public control of, over the Federal Reserve System was necessary. However, the Freedom Budget Campaign missed its brief window of opportunity between 1964 and 1966, when conceivably a Bobby Kennedy, Jacob Javits sponsored bill might have had a chance in Congress. The story of that struggle, which is a, too, uh, a bit too long to get into here, would lay the basis, however, for the subsequent decade's efforts. In the wake of her husband's assassination, Coretta Scott King would become one of the most forceful advocates of these goals. Glancing at the political landscape in 1974, Scott King could see the growing urgency of the economic situation. The 1970s stagflation crisis was devastating for the most marginalized workers and their families. Accordingly, Scott King created the National Committee for Full Employment and the Full Employment Action Council. Around, this, around the same time, legislators like Augustus Hawkins and Hubert Humphrey were working towards similar ends. Hawkins had been a key legislator behind Title VII of, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited employment discrimination. He knew a lesson that the lawyer and civil rights activist Polly Murray had emphasized back in the 1940s, that true fair employment could only be achieved by, by full employment. In, 1970, in October 1973, Hawkins had organized a conference between researchers and policymakers on the topic at UCLA. In his introductory remarks, Hawkins traced some of the legacies of the 1946 Employment Act and also pointed towards a path forward. 
30 years ago, quote, he said, 30 years ago, as the wartime election of 1944 came, came to a close, both, Democrat, uh, both Democratic and Republican candidates pledged themselves to jobs for all. Under the Employment Act, America took two important steps in the right direction. First, it expressed the country's determination to never again tolerate mass depression. Second, it set up the first, the first beginnings of democratic machinery for national policy making and planning. However, Hawkins noted that significant unemployment remained, especially for African Americans. Quote, the brutal fact remains that the full employment levels achieved during World War II have never again been attained. One of the key impediments at the time was greater, to greater coordination of economic policy was a Federal Reserve that was most inattentive to the policy implications of the Employment Act and even Congress itself. At the UCLA Symposium, a senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee complained that they had trouble getting even basic information from the Fed. Over the coming years, as interest rates, as interest rates and unemployment rates ascended, Scott King's coalition continued to build their movement. While Hawkins and Humphrey drafted and introduced legislation to, to ameliorate the crisis of unemployment. Hawkins drew explicitly on the stifled efforts of prior years. As he explained, quote, we must not replay the drama of events which led to the watering down and lessening of the full employment commitment contained in the Employment Act of 1946. Three decades have since passed and combined with the current situation thrust before us the urgent need for a commitment to the goals of genuine full employment and the guaranteed right to a job for each individual who wants to work. And Scott King decried the situation. The unemployed are not pawns to be sacrificed in some economic chess game, she said. She told lawmakers at an Atlanta unemployment hearing that, quote, accepting unemployment to control inflation amounts to choosing the people at the very bottom of the economic pyramid to bear the entire, uh, to bear the entire burden. In the so-called war against inflation, America's 10 million unemployed have been the administration's conscript army. This conflict over democratic governance of economic life is one element that the Humphrey Hawkins Act of 1978 sought to settle. Some of this was reconciled in the Federal Reserve uh, Reform Act of 1977, which firmly established the Fed's employment mandate. As Andrew B. Miller, director of the AFL-CIO's Department of Legislation, testified in support of the act in July 1977, quote, what irks us is that the Fed is supposed to be a creature of Congress, but you have to dig pretty deep to find that out because the Fed has been acting so independent for years and years that you sometimes wonder if they know that Congress exists at all. For example, we've repeatedly said, if we are ever to get the Humphrey Hawkins bill or any reasonable facim facsimile thereof, the Fed has got to be pulled into the fight for full employment. The Federal Reserve Reform Act was created in the context of Scott King's activism and the more far-reaching proposals to alleviate the unemployment crisis from Senator Humphrey and Congressman Hawkins. Scott King's coalition sponsored a vibrant and successful full employment action week, which featured actions in 300 cities and mobilized over 1.5 million people from September 4th through 10th, 1977. The Massachusetts Coalition for Full Employment organized a solar heating and weatherizing work-in with building trades officials to show what types of work needed to be done. And they began plans to coordinate with the Clamshaw Alliance and Science for the People environmental organizations to show how full employment could be utilized for new energy sources. In Des Moines, Iowa, a local coalition organized an unemployed hotline and and began an unemployed people's union with support of public sector workers. 60,000 people attended a 24-hour vigil in Buffalo, New York, where they signed petitions to deliver to President Carter. In Kansas City, 25,000 people rallied for full employment. A member of the laborers union held a sign reading, jobs are human rights, we stand for full employment. In Erie, Pennsylvania, had a full employment parade with 130 floats and saw 40,000 people come out to support. Congressman Hawkins believed that the organizing for the week of protest was the greatest since the March on Washington. After a tumultuous journey to become law, the Humphrey Hawkins Act of 1978 
finally emphasize greater coordination between fiscal and monetary policy toward the goal of full employment. There was a tremendous fight, however, about what precisely full employment meant. But the law stipulated that the unemployment rate be reduced to 3% for those over, over the age of 20 by 1983 and 4% for those over the age of 16. Humphrey Hawkins also demanded that, quote, every effort be made to reduce disparities between the unemployment rates for youth, women, handicapped persons, veterans, middle-aged and older persons, and other labor market groups. However, these provisions have rarely been enforced with any degree of seriousness. Nevertheless, the law now required the Fed to submit semi-annual written reports about what they were doing to achieve the new law's goals, as well as providing Congress with semi-annual testimony about their actions. During the press conference after signing the law, Scott King noted its importance, quote, this is indeed a great historical occasion, perhaps as significant as the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Perhaps in the future, she said, history will record it as being even more significant because I think it deals with an issue on a basic human right that's the most basic of all human rights, the right to a job. As Scott King illuminated, the law provided a compass to orient economic policymakers. However, this wasn't envisioned as the end of the journey. For Hawkins, Scott King, and many others who pursued full employment, the law was an important step, but not the last. After all, the law's proponents had granted numerous concessions during the legislative process, weakening the full employment mandate from a commitment to a goal, and scrapping the pledge that the government would be the employer of last resort. As Scott King announced after its passage, quote, Humphrey Hawkins is a vital first step all of the gains of the movement my husband led in the 50s and 60s were not accomplished all at once. So she announced, we will be back in Washington year after year until there is full employment. More than 40 years after the Humphrey Hawkins Act was signed into law, a full employment economy that fulfills Scott King's vision for racial and economic justice has yet to be achieved. Significant racial disparities and economic conditions persist. Humphrey Hawkins, has demonstrated progress, however, by stipulating that monetary policy is a necessary part of the equation and by holding the Federal Reserve accountable to the ways that its policies impact unemployment. When one is in the midst of a struggle, it can be difficult to know that a victory might be on the horizon. Consider a speech that Bayard Rustin gave less than a month after the March on Washington. On the heels of his greatest success in almost three decades of consistent organizing, Rustin told his audience, quote, we are losing the fight, my friends, quickly. Where have we gained? Where have we made progress? This is a revolution which is succeeding. It is not. In September 1963, Rustin didn't know that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were on the horizon. In my more optimistic moments, I like to think that the 80-year-long struggle for full employment is in one of these moments that we're in one point in a long relay race. We're getting closer in some, but we're getting closer in some key respects. When I started studying this history more than a decade ago, I wouldn't have imagined that the Democratic Party would put full employment back into the party platform as it did in 2016 under pressure from activists. Coretta Scott King passed the, passed the baton to groups like Policy Link, the Sunrise Movement, and the Modern Money Network and politicians like Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. If and when the ongoing struggles are successful, the efforts of these prior organizers will cease to, be, to appear as failure and begin to resemble preparation. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was extremely enlightening and I uh, really appreciate going through that history. Okay, so next up to speak, we have Matthew Robinson. Matthew is a PhD student in economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He's a research assistant at the Center for Economic Information and a research fellow for the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. His research explores reparations, black community economic development, and a job guarantee. And Matthew, you have presenter privileges now. You may share your screen and take us away. Uh, first off, thank you for having me. Um, really appreciate it there. Make sure I stay the time. Um, 
Okay, so we're going to talk about black community economic development and the federal jobs guarantee. A uh, lot of this is going to be punctuated with um, not personal stories, but like examples. Uh, at this point in time, lots of my personal experience and kind of applied work really mesh with the theoretical stuff that we're talking about. I'm going to talk about the church folks later. Um, if anybody's been to a black church, you will know the saying that you have to prepare to receive your blessings kind of thing. And so I, I'm kind of working with this presentation in that manner. We don't have a federal jobs guarantee yet. But when we do, it's going to be there. It's going to you know happen quickly. And so part of, I think, preparing for that, preparing for reparations is to um, see what see what we have now. What's happening now? What kinds of jobs are being performed now? How will those things fit in? What are the needs? And how will that fit into a federal jobs guarantee program? So why black communities? Um, these tend to be places that have suffered the most, along with reservations from kind of our current development patterns that we have there. Um, happens to align again with my personal and professional experiences. I will be sharing some stories that some of my friends, neighbors, colleagues um, have along the way. So it's not that I am speaking for the black community, certainly, um, but I have these stories and experiences that help guide uh, this research that, that we're going for here, or uh, that we're conducting here. Um, and I think that uh, the flows into this next part here is that lessons are going to, can be applied to different places um, and this should complicate things. You will have to understand the needs of every community, the assets of every community, the triumphs, the challenges that every community or every neighborhood faces. And so it's not like, hey, this is a thing that we can do for black communities and one size fits all, copy paste. It's, it's the opposite of that. It's acknowledging that um, Kansas City is going to have different needs than Los Angeles, than Miami, than Detroit. And really grappling with those things. And that's a tough thing to do. Um, so this isn't a bootstrap story. It, I'm going to tell you about some of the things that are being, um, that are being done now that would fit into a jobs guarantee program. Um, this should in fact, highlight the fact that bootstraps aren't enough. The work is being done. The current state of things is um, as good as it's going to get at, under our current kind of regime here. Things could be worse, but lots of people are engaging in unpaid labor. And despite the current, um, you know, absence of a jobs guarantee program, despite our current development patterns, um, this work is, is still being done. And I'd also like to thank um, all the organizers for this conference and Jordan and David. Okay, so um, as, as David highlighted, you know, some of this, we've got this post-war development, we've got white flight, excuse me, in the birth of the, of the suburbs and then uh, like white American middle class. And that meant divestment from the urban cores. Um, this had a big impact on black communities. So highways built right on through the middle of black neighborhoods. Um, and this has resulted in poor health outcomes. You know, if all of a sudden there's a highway in your backyard, your kids aren't going to grow up probably super healthy or less healthy than they would be otherwise. So all these things kind of connect. Sprawl out into the suburbs. Um, segregation, lots of this is the result of the desire to maintain segregated schools. And then infrastructures built around those desires. It emphasized the priority was white um, community economic development, right? Here are the suburbs, and we're going to build infrastructure to accommodate that. We're going to use public money to accommodate those, those wants. 
fears, really. And, you know, everybody else is just going to have to deal with it. That's what we're spending our money on. Those are our priorities. Um, so commutes, um, tick up. Folks will drive into a city, work, drive back out to the suburbs, which means we don't really need so much public transportation. Uh, if we we're talking about Kansas City, yeah, it used to have one of the most extensive rail, like it's not a light rail, it's like a neighborhood rail system in the country. All of a sudden, the suburbs were born. You didn't need that anymore because everybody was living out in the suburbs. So you nixed it. It's gone now. And now they're rebuilding it, right? Now it's very expensive to rebuild these things that they had 100 years ago, but decided they didn't need it anymore because of, of this kind of birth of the suburbs. And all that connects to climate change, right? So it's, it's all kind of tied together there. And what do we see now? Gentrification, kind of. Housing's all over the place. Right, but kind of this gentrification thing um, in this move back into urban cores, which means there's a new kind of reshuffling of neighborhood neighborhood lines, um, how housing, how neighborhoods are define themselves, uh, depending on where you are. I know plenty of folks are from New York. Well, Harlem's not the old Harlem anymore. Um, I spent some years in Denver. And the historic black neighborhood is called Five Points. It's not called Five Points anymore. Once they change the name of your neighborhood, that's it. Like gentrification to the to the moon at that point. Um, a couple years ago, I read this story. I think it was by Charles Blow, and uh, he was out in Harlem, kind of exploring this gentrification process. Some kids, black kids, rode up on their bicycle, asked him what was going on, and so he explained gentrification for to them. And one of the kids like looks up, you can see him thinking, you can see him thinking, hits his friend on the shoulder and says, I told you when they were putting in those trees, they weren't for us. That's gentrification, right? That is this development pattern and neighborhoods know that children know that those aren't for us. They didn't put those in for us. That Whole Foods isn't for us. That new coffee shop isn't for us. It's for these new residents. So we're looking to flip that around, right? So, um, I like maps. Jordan, Jordan and I work with maps, and so everybody knows we like maps. Uh, this is a map of Kansas City. This is called a racial dot map. So this is from 2020 census. Every particular person who filled out their census form has a dot, right? And every dot um, is color-coded according to race and ethnicity. So this is Kansas City, brown would be white, and yellow will be black. And right down the center there, you can see a pretty clear delineation between white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods. And surrounding the urban core, this is mostly brown dots, right? And it's mostly mostly white folks. That's a result of, of white flight. This is Kansas City. This is Buffalo, New York. Most of us have become pretty familiar with Buffalo over the past, uh, say, what, week and a half. Same kind of patterns in Buffalo. This is Detroit. There's a pretty clear line across the middle there. That's the infamous, uh, was it, uh, 8 Mile? That's what it is, the Eminem movie, whatever. And again, the surrounding uh, with the white suburbs. Wherever you look, these patterns are pretty similar okay so let's flip this around and let's say hey we're going to prioritize uh, black community economic development instead you know instead of white flight and the suburbs uh, this should be based around health and wellness not just money money is important income is important but the health and wellness piece um, should be at least as, as important as as just income and just wealth. It's nice if you've got the money, but if you've got cancer because um, you're downwind from the rendering plant, this is not, again, this is one of those examples I'm talking about. If you need a new kidney, kidney because you grow up in a um, food desert and downwind from the rendering plant, well, it sucks, you know? Money's not enough to fix that. Um, 
let's see. So the normal, I want to point out kind of like the mainstream conception of this is just to pick up individuals out of underdeveloped areas and drop them into the suburbs. So you're dislocating somebody from their neighborhood, the social ties that they have, and drop them somewhere else and saying, hey, they earn more money. Isn't that great? Well, how about we, how about you just develop underdeveloped areas, right? Put the resources into places that need them instead of taking this kind of individualistic approach, um, which is a get why I am focusing on community economic development rather than just like the bootstrappy, hey, if everybody graduated from high school and college, they can move to the suburbs. That's not enough and not helpful. Okay, how do we go about these kinds of things? Well, um, I will point to some of the work of a UMKC professor named by the name of uh, Linwood Tahid. He says, train community economists. Why aren't universities and economics department going out and recruiting people from areas that need this kind of development and training them in how to do it? Um, this community capitalist framework is important because you have to understand what communities have already, what resources are there. It's not this idea that um, underdeveloped or under-resourced black communities don't have anything. They have plenty. You need to understand what you have and where you want to go um, to come up with a plan to get there. And experts, us, lawyers, economists, or whatever you happen to do, should be assisting in that process, right? So it's community-led and then assisted by um, folks who consider there's some, you know, who are experts in public health or public planning, things like this. And a job guarantee should understand the work that's already in place. Um, lots of that's going to be unpaid care work, right? I have I have a neighbor. I'm looking at his house right now. It's right out my window. Uh, he basically runs, he doesn't know this, but he basically runs an internship program. If you want to learn heating and cooling, well, everybody knows you come to this house. He takes you along on jobs. He doesn't get paid for it, but this is how this is how things work, right? Um, there are some houses down the street. If you don't have enough for childcare, you go and you know it's not great, but you, there's childcare there for you, and you owe a favor, right? But things like this already exist. The point of a job guarantee should be to fold those things in, not you know come from some administrator back in DC or something like that, but from folks who are actually already doing these, these kinds of um, jobs, organizing efforts. Um, you have to respect existing institutions and programs. So look at neighborhood associations, violence and eruption programs. Um, this has been a new kind of public safety uh, thing. Um, unfortunately, well, if, if you want like Google ceasefire or cure violence, uh, those are great programs. Unfortunately, they aren't funded very well. And unfortunately, really unfortunately, um, sometimes that's the only time that folks have access to mental health services is when there's a crisis. So we're talking about preventing crises. Violence interruption programs often are a way to connect people with resources, but there has to be a crisis before that connection happens. Uh, there are church folks networks. Oh my gosh. Um, old black folks have networks like crazy. I know we talk about social networks now. Old black folks have had social networks since we got here, basically. So respect those networks. Understand that those are a resource. Um, and then what I'll call the roughneck resources. These are, these are folks, usually guys, who don't show up to church. They're skilled laborers. Um, they work in construction. They're handymen. They make things happen in neighborhoods. But they're not showing up to church. And are oftentimes not showing up to a focus groups and, and things like that. But there's a network of them in every community. 
in every black community in this country and understanding that these things already exist, but folding them in, making an effort to fold them in into a job guarantee program is going to be very important. So areas to target, unsatisfying act, answer, but it depends on where you are and the cause that you're looking for, right? But what, whatever you happen to be involved in, housing guarantee, job guarantee, um, community health, you know, sustainability, it's going to depend on that area that, that you're focusing in. And then um, you're going to have to understand that there are entrenched interests, even in the black community, who like things this way. So I'll point to the, the work of stratification economists who say we don't just structure ourselves according to race, but within those categories, we'll structure ourselves. So there are certain, frankly, well-off black folks in the community who like this kind of thing. They like being king of the mountain and aren't going to be into this kind of thing. Um, and understanding that, I think, is important when we're talking about, talking about job guarantees, public health, um, what have you. I'm actually dealing with that right now, so it's not an exaggeration. Okay, takeaway for you. We have plenty of data and information. Lots of us are academics or experts or whatever. Cool. Um, we're surrounded all the time by too much information and too much data. We are looking for wisdom. Where do you find that? The people. Um, you have expertise in something. You have to understand, figure out where that expertise is going to fit into this. Right? It's going to be community led and your expertise is going can fit in there somewhere. But you just have to figure out where that is. Um, so it's a personal in, a, asset inventory. Right? So you have to figure out how you can contribute to existing causes. And then you have to learn institutions and how to exploit them. And I'm not, I, I was thinking about like, should I put exploit that word in there? Um, yes. A couple of months ago, I was talking with a, you know, a econ professor from another institution. And I was talking about how I hate these, you know, higher ed funding, whatever. And he's like, you're an institutionalist, right? I was like, yeah. I guess so. He's like, well, learn the institution and exploit it. There are things that you want done. And it's not about like or dislike. This is what is. You learn the institution and you exploit it for what you want. Because those other people are. They sure as hell are. And so wherever you are, your program, professional life, neighborhood, whatever, understand your institutions. And then learn how to exploit them, um, you know, for the cause, for whatever cause that you were, you know, advocating for or working with. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you very much for your time. Our last speaker for today is Jordan. Now, Jordan is a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Jordan began a research position with the Economic De Democracy Initiative in February 2021, a new initiative from Open Society University Network and Bard College supporting research, policy design, and the development of curricular activities covering labor markets, inequality, and other social deprivations, where he leads the initiative's community and civic engagement activities, participatory research, and curricular development. He's a second generation Mexican American and Kansas Cityan with roots in the historic west side of Kansas City and Mexican railroad workers in Kansas. His research bridges economics, planning, economic geography, and public policy. He conducts applied research using qualitative and quantitative data and analysis, community based research methods, and spatial analysis through the lens of stratification economics. Now, Jordan, tap us off. So I'm not going to share any slides. I'm going to try to bring some of the, uh, the way I try to enter spaces of, you know, when we're doing organizing conversations some power building organizing. And so I'm going to try to share some stories of, you know, of certainly work that I've been engaged in, but it's certainly not my own. So I want to say that up front that a lot of the genius in about, <laughs> I feel the genius and some of the perspectives on how we push social movement or, or social provisioning through you know, movement organizing are coming from the experience of those, you know, housing insecure 
facing the housing injustice, facing injustice in the workplace. Um, yeah, so at the at the root of it, I want to make sure that I share that to start. It's wonderful to be here with David and Matthew. I, you know, quite humbled to be here to speak with you both, and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak, Ashley, and the and MMN. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about, um, in particular, the work um, of KC Tenants, Kansas City Tenants, a tenant union and organizing power organizing organization based in Kansas City, Missouri, and working a bit across state lines. Um, thank you, Matthew, for having the having the maps to get us started. Oh, you might see my dog in the background. Apologies for that. Um, thank you for getting us started with some of those maps because I think that helps to show right Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas right share a, are right across the state line, Missouri and Kansas. And I want to also highlight some work that's happening in Kansas City, Kansas. And I think we might even have someone from one of the organizations I had planned to mention, uh, WICO Mutual Aid, here on the call with us, which is wonderful to see, unless it's the same name of someone else. So I want to share a little bit about starting starting with the history of this area and my connection. That's why I put that also in my in my introduction that to be read is that um, have those roots and have been motivated, um, I guess sometimes by the righteous anger, sometimes by the um, just the history and stories that my family would tell of being in the west side so the west side is an historic um latinx historic mexican-american community um since the early you know since the beginning of the 20th century uh, my family came up as railroad workers and that community has you know has, has historically resided in both the north and south of the west side and now um is really relegated to parts of the south west side where you know the the so-called uh, creative class Richard Florida's creative class has taken over the north side um you know where my home that my family lived in for 70 80 years is now uh, is now about you know 1.5 million dollars or 1 million dollars right there's a lot of um of displacement that has occurred over the last 20 years and that is something that motivated me um as well as my own housing story which I considered sharing more of but I think I'll just say with you know, with facing abuse in the home, facing, um, you know, never having that safe, that safe place to be a safe structure, right, where family is really people for me. Um, and I want to share a few stories of others in Casey Tenants in a moment. Um, but want to share that personal connection, right, to this work. Um, I think Matt, Matthew, uh, you know, did a great job of sharing his personal connection to the, to this work as well. And how that you know how that relates to what we are passionate about, what we are throwing down on, what we are enthusiastic about. So, Kansas City has this history, this this you know really kind of coastal style gentrification in the west side, um, also starting to happen on the east side of KC, the predominantly black community, um, and then in an area where I'm doing a lot of my uh, my dissertation work in the historic northeast neighborhoods, just east of downtown Kansas City, Missouri, um, where you have 40% of the neighborhood that is that is foreign born. So um, also, Kansas City has a quite an interesting here, history within, um, you know, influencing federal, the Federal Housing Administration policy, the FHA, where J.C. Nichols, uh, a real estate developer who developed our um, kind of well-known plaza, as we call it, the, the, the plaza shopping district, and then developed white-only neighborhoods uh, surrounding that. You. He was one of the first, um, one of the first to to put in place these restrictive covenants that became very popular, very commonly used across the country, where you could not sell a house to anyone who wasn't um, white or often white male. Um, and that present that that oppression, that subordination of black and brown and immigrant folks continues to this day in Kansas City. Um, yeah, we have to thank for having to mow a lawn. JC, yeah, JC Nichols was uh, quite a powerful figure in the national, the, the national, I forget the whole thing, the NAREB, the real estate board, and then also influenced a lot of the federal housing administration policies. Um, and that, that includes the redlining that, you know, you saw they still exist today in Kansas City with a pretty stark divide between black and white KC, north and south along Troost historically. Um, but now with gentrification pressures, um, with some, you know, the result of our university, University of Missouri, Kansas City existence, right, kind of uh, pushing the black community further east and, and students moving in, as well as another private college right next to UMKC. But all across, all down, up and down Troost, um, you know, black and brown businesses are being replaced. Black businesses are in, predominantly are being replaced by coffee shops, um, by the juice shops, um, by, you know, thousand dollar a month um, apartments, which in Kansas City is is quite high. Um, so I want to jump in a little bit to Casey Tenants. So Casey Tenants was founded in 2019. 
um, by women and mothers from across the city. Um, and, it, and also led by at, at the beginning um, and really instigated by Tara Ragavir's um, research on eviction in Kansas City. So she was able to present this research all around Kansas City and got to the point of, you know, so we know the data, well, nothing's happening. I've shared this data with the mayor, I've shared this data with the city, right? And I think that Matt also made a good uh, reference to this as well. Is we have the data, we have the understanding of what's happening, right? We need to bring in that on the ground knowledge. We need to value that other, that other knowledge so that we have this, this full story. And so these, uh, Tara came back to KC to start this organizing effort with these women and, and mothers from across the city in 2019 and have had um, an, an incredible impact on the city. Something I think uh, quite unprecedented and in many ways, some of the most um, you know, meaningful, impactful policies, uh, policy changes around housing in the city that we've, that we've seen, at least in my lifetime. Um, so KC Tenants is all about like, what can we do today so that tomorrow we can do what we cannot do today. So how do we create those conditions so that we can create tomorrow, uh, create tomorrow what we cannot do today? And that's, that, that framing, that disruption that came from this work has been incredibly impactful to where KC Tenants is a force, even when they're not in the room. So KC Tenants has, yeah, there you go, Matt. Thank you for putting that in there. So KC Tenants is, is something that one of their, you know, I'll give a couple examples of to their approach, right? So the first is relational organizing. And this is an organization I consider myself, I'm a leader with KC Tenants as well, and I've been participating since to, uh, the early 2020. Um, relational organizing or organizing at the speed of trust. I think a very good quote from uh, one of the directors there, organizing at the speed of trust. So really focusing on relationships across those with seemingly divergent interests, right? Bridging different interests and engaging in genuinely and for the first time in my lifetime, again, at least, um, an organizing effort to pass these social provisioning policies that is actively anti-racist, that is multi-generational in a genuine sense and multiracial. Right, led by those facing the brunt, the you know most severe brunt of housing injustice, um, both the local and national and federal policies. Another, I think another good thing from our uh, community agreements when we first get to a meeting, organizing across all lines the other side uses to divide us. So um, the a second part of their approach with that relational organizing is facilitating trainings, education, and skill building, um, which is I've been very fortunate to get to be a part of. Um, honestly, I have to say that, you know, the fact that I do have some applied data science skills, the fact that I do know now how to show up in the classroom, I think, in a more meaningful way, is has a lot to do with participation in these sorts of uh, activities, right? So facilitating trainings that identify collective and personal interests and emphasize the important importance of um, collective power building. Third, um, a really important tenet of their approach or aspect of their approach is creating a space to lean into and explore tensions, right? Uh, and I think I'm gonna jump to some of the outcomes. Yeah, some of the outcomes. So excuse me, I'm in a fairly loud place now. So some of the outcomes in 2019, they passed a tenant bill of rights. I shut my window here. They passed the Tenant Bill of Rights um, for the first time, providing, you know, in, in uh, statute protections for tenants across Kansas City, Missouri. Um, we established in uh, 2021 with, uh, with the support and, and leadership of the um, Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom, the uh, right to counsel for low-income tenants that will go into place this summer. There have been over 300 media stories, local and national about both the, both the actions and disruptions, but also policy proposals that we've put together. Um, we've come together to provide uh, extensive recommendations, a 40-page well-researched document which really centers the knowledge of those closest to the problem um, on a housing trust fund policy. And we are a large part about bringing a more just, um, more tailored to not just homeowner interests or developer interests, housing trust fund legislation that was passed last year. Um, knocked over 30,000 doors across the state of Missouri. There's also a, a bit of an effort led by KC Tenants and supported by KC Tenants to organize and rule South, um, Southern Missouri. 
um, 70 plus weekly uh, attendees at the weekly meeting, 70 plus attendees, um, over 500 leaders at this point, growing over 100 each year since 2019. Um, a power building hotline um, run by you know, solidarity callers, as we call them, which, which has fielded over 3,000 calls during the pandemic when I was working with them on the, on the hotline. Uh, got to a point where we had about 20% of all formal evictions. Uh, we had uh, detailed records and were able to actually provide support to them on those on those eviction on those um, forced displacements, informal and formal. And then now we have about six uh, six or more tenant unions that have been able to kind of be created and in some way supported or tangential to KC tenants work. Um, one thing I'm, uh, you know, slightly proud of, I have to admit, is when we, um, one of the times when I was really deeply involved in supporting um, some really incredible genius leaders in stopping over 900 evictions, eviction hearings in 20, in this January of 2021, called it No Eviction January, and we're able to stop while not that while there weren't 900 people on the docket for that particular set of that month, there were those 900 attempts at evictions that were stopped by court disruptions, both online and in person, including chaining the doors to the courthouse shut. Um, and then, yeah, several, there's been several attempts um, or efforts within KC tenants to, and, and successful efforts to stop developments that were unjust, that were going to be gentrifying parts of the city, both in the Midtown, um, more you know diverse area according to race and white and black, um, but also across the east side, west side, and north of Kansas City. So one powerful aspect of their work, right, is reframing housing as a public issue rather than a private problem and expanding who, um, who we consider and view and frame as affected by the crisis, right, from that narrow division, uh, de definition and image of homelessness to all tenants and residents, right, framing housing as a human right. And a few, few more remarks if I have time. Um, where was this here? Yeah. yeah, I guess I'll end with this. I, I just listening to David and, and Robinson or to Matthew speak. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight is how, you know, how this organizing up these organizing efforts in KC and kind of for the first time in Kansas City. And I think a, a great example of it, you know, for the world of coming from a position of abundance, right? Dreaming of a world of abundance and then working to change the conditions of what is possible. And I think this connects well, even though I haven't used the word or the terms or concepts directly from modern monetary theory with, um, you know, a more interdisciplinary approach to what that would look like. And this organizing that does, you know, discuss, you know, federal policies and how they, how they relate to what's happening on the ground in Kansas City that is really advocating for the use of public funds of public money with that frame for more just um, more just outcomes with the use of different federal funds. And I'll stop there. I'll stop there. I'm happy to share a little bit more about what's going on in KC, but I'll stop there in the in the regards to time. So thank you so much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Jordan. That was phenomenal to get your uh, addition to this uh, collaborative conversation as well. So um, we're going to move on to some audience questions now um, to throw them towards you folks. So anybody that has any questions, I would ask that you please post them in the public chat. Now, I noticed one a little while back. We'll start with that one um, from PG. Do we need to understand today's pushback to a job guarantee analogous to the hurdles in the 70s, specifically erosion of the message within Sunrise to millions of good paying jobs and related movement realities, add DSA retrenchment on job guarantee in their Green New Deal priority campaign? Um, anyone who wants to take that, uh, go for it. Feel free to do discuss amongst yourselves. Oh, David, we, we can't hear you at the moment. Um, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen beside uh, the webcam, which should be leave audio. You have to click that, and then you'll have the option for just listening or microphone. Uh, click the microphone. OK, can you hear me? Great. Loud and clear. Yeah, I can take some of that, PG, without um, speaking 
too directly to kind of some of the strategic questions of Sunrise or um, or DSA, I think one thing that I often, one, I think there's two elements. One, what I kind of suggested is this collapse of full employment with a low general unemployment environment. So in many ways, over the past 40 years, we've inherited a definition of full employment that is basically a Nairu definition of full employment. Full employment at, you know, four to five percent unemployment or whatever, whatever Larry Summers thinks is the uh, appropriate level of unemployment in any in any given moment. But I think that's one element of kind of antagonistic visions of full employment that, that have been, you know, uh, maintained into the present and is one thing to actively combat. Another thing in terms of kind of the landscape of political possibility is, and the landscape of struggle, is that one thing I often say is that in terms of a guaranteed job, we should uh, guarantee job struggles. And I say this with all humility and seriousness, we should be prepared that if history is a guide, these movements might need to be stronger than the civil rights movement was in the 1960s or in the 1970s. And that I'd love to be wrong. I'd love for kind of things to break right histo correctly historically, and maybe that type of strength, um, social movement strength is not necessary. But, you know, if history can guide us, then then it may need movements as strong as that or stronger, which should daunt us and humble us, but also uh, we should tr take, we should take very seriously as well. And so I think the questions of what kind of antagonisms these movements will face are very serious. And I think we can see them right now um, when there's you know, elevated inflation, how quickly so many economists and policymakers are towards saying, we got to increase the unemployment rate. That's the only way we can deal with inflation. And so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of dangers on, on, on the landscape, and I don't think we should delude ourselves that those are not there. Thank you for that, David. Um, if neither of you have anything else to add at the moment, uh, I'll, I'll throw another question at you. Um, so how do you think local organizing can build momentum for federally implemented policies like the job guarantee and the homes guarantee? Um, do, like, do you think there's a pathway uh, to either policy through widespread local implementation? Maybe touching on some of what uh, Matthew and Jordan spoke on. I'll, I'll throw that to you guys. Sure, I'm happy to get us started um, since I'm off mute. Uh, I think, I mean, one part of it is the framing aspect. I think that's very powerful looking at it as, you know, how do we use public money for the public purpose? How can we dream in an area with uh, in mind that we have this abundance, that we have this possibility of making these things happen and using that to frame and, and you know, make us aware of what's possible at the local level. And then things are, when, when done well and with, um, you know, with the support of those really and led by those really closest to that problem or closest and most affected, that stuff has um, a lot of power. I mean, I, I can't, it's not just to to brag or to say that this is, you know, um, just a sexy topic that there have been 300 internet, you know, national, international and local news stories on the work that's happening, not just with Casey tenants um, in Atlanta and LA and Minneapolis um, in New York, of course, in Buffalo, namely where like that's the center of uh, housing justice work in north in the upstate new york i think um that framing is is very important and i'll stop there if matt um has anything to share or i can keep going uh, i think social media plays a part in this right um i think jordan's correct is I, i've seen news stories on casey tenants all over the place like national news um so seeing it go from something that was an idea to um, my experience hearing about it through Jordan and then watching kind of the engagement with it 
online through news stories and on social media. And then this this new, um, I think that's echoed by this this new thing with unionizing, right? It's like, oh, we can we can do that, right? It, there's always this break, right? It took that first Starbucks to unionize, and then all of a sudden you've got dozens of these things popping up. Um, we'll see how it goes with Amazon, but that's a that's a tool, right? That's a tool in showing and sharing how your experience went, and then helping others um, engage in these same kind of processes, and that. You know, I I guess it's a an opportunity for hope, right? It's like you don't have to go through the normal channels of organizing, which is face to face or through mail, um, or through your traditional, you know, media lenses, whether or not they want to cover it, because oftentimes they're kind of the folks who this is against. Um, but I, th- I think that's an opportunity. It's a way for hope. And uh, folks are, are capitalizing on that. I think our organizers are really good about capitalizing on that, not just the work, but almost like the advertising of it, right? There's there's a public face to it. And um, so it's interesting how, how these things will, will progress. Thank you. Uh, we have a follow-up question from PG. Are there movement lessons from the experience of ARPA funds distribution? How did public participation work on not work and how to make headway based on that? Anyone who wants to take that, go ahead. I, I don't know if this is going to directly answer the question, but I'll jump in just to share uh, about my experience and the Casey Tennant's experience and well, just organizers and Casey in general, both on the, both sides of the state line. Um, where the fact that there was attention, the fact that um, this movement and it's, you know, I of course had to skip out about a lot of the really important context and history that led to this moment where Casey Tennant is so powerful, um, of course, do a lot to the the, the the tactics and the strategy used, the movement uh, lessons they have been able to teach us, but that there was someone to keep the cities, the county accountable. There was someone watching and someone that, like I said, genuinely, I, you know, you show up in city council meetings, you show up in other, you know, kind of private sector, like, you know, nonprofit um, housing coalition meetings, regardless of whether we're there or not. Right. The fact that these ideas have bubbled up so strongly and that are much more present in the co- local conversation has you know even without the presence of a leader from casey tenants led to or a leader from other organizing coalitions um including you know michael Michael mutual a which i didn't get to in this presentation and and what they've done in wyandotte county which is just across the state line in kansas city kansas is having that having folks know that we're watching right and know that you know we we need to be able to use these funds in a just way in kc there was a lot of fights back and forth where you know we were just under five hundred thousand people which was the cutoff um in the last census but in the last five years, we've we've reached that by thousands. So we did not get a direct, um, direct. I think this is I'm thinking about the right program, a direct payment. So we were going after county funds. So I'll stop there. Thanks for that, Jordan. If there is nothing else, anyone else has to add at the moment, I'll throw another question at you. Uh, so based on historical precedent. Do you think the recent wave of labor organization at Amazon, Starbucks, et cetera, is it important of a labor movement that could push for bigger legislative changes at the federal level? I know this was kind of briefly touched on, but uh, if any of you want to expand on that at all, I'd be happy to hear it. Yes. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, as I was kind of suggesting, to win a federal job guarantee will take a massive class struggle. And the more forms of, the more organized people uniting everywhere is going to be necessary in that. The greater elevation of uh, 
broader consciousness will be will be essential to to all of those things and so i've been inspired and heartened by this this recent wave of organizing i think it also points to the need to kind of you know slow the fed's interest rate uh, interest rates um, decisions. I, I recall, you know, a few months ago, a friend of mine and the labor historian Gabe Wynant referred to this current wave of organizing as kind of racing against the Fed. And and I think, you know, I hope I hope Gabe is was wrong in that, but I think he 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 might be correct. And so, you know, I think let's get let's get these unions recognized and let's figure out how to create public pressure campaigns so Amazon, Starbucks, and so on are actually forced to bargain contracts with, with those unions. Because we know that, you know, winning a union is one thing and winning that first contract is, is another, especially when you're up against behemoths like, like Amazon and Starbucks. I just want to reiterate, you know, Matt, Matt David's uh, first point of, uh, you know, this is definitely going to take these social movements. I think this conversation, I was very happy to see it on the MMT conference schedule. And it's been wonderful to partake in a few other conversations like this, where if we don't have this social movement, if we, it is that that makes this possible, that changes the conditions of what's possible. And I think to add to what David said, uh, other than just reiterating, is that it, it needs to be democratic, right? Uh, and and I, I really like Michael Besner's work. I think there are other democratic frameworks, frameworks for democ you know, participatory democracy. Um, we need to be leaning on that to, in order to make these gains possible and so that it is genuinely intersectional, right? Where in housing, in the fight for the homes guarantee, um, you know, there are both statistical and, of course, historical stories and, you know, and qualitative that, that show how much black women in particular black mothers are at the front of these struggles. Right. Um, and I think that there are, you know, lots of different stories to be told about, you know, these those facing housing injustice um, that can bring together people uh, in an international in an international intersectional um, uh, social movement. I'll stop there. I think um, an important part of this is storytelling, right? So, so I feel like each of us have told a little bit of the story and not got, you know, the, the details are important, of course, for policymakers and administrators and stuff like that. But these stories, I think, really grab people and make it personal for them. Um, I'm, I think, <laughs> I don't know if, this is the case or not. I think Americans have very short memories, right? There's a huge fight for a job guarantee in the sixties um, with, with tons and tons of civil rights organizations. And that's not in your kid's textbook, right? Most of us are still digging through, you know, David's work is fantastic and looking forward to the book. And so we as academics sometimes get that and other folks don't right civil rights struggles you know a week in february and we're gonna learn about martin luther king and rosa parks and now everything's fine right and now we've gone through 60 years of this kind of atomistic like you're out on your own because everything's great and fine and all that and if you deserve a job you have it instead of and we, we've disconnected this employment from civil rights struggle thing and voting rights thing. We've disconnected those things. And so I think the storytelling aspect is super important. And um, these laws, these, you know, anti-CRT laws, which have just resulted in like civil rights books being like jettisoned from schools is a bit scary to me in addition to plenty of the other legislation they've got going on it's a bit scary to me because it's uh in addition to not understand the connection between the jobs guarantee and the civil rights struggle which has gone back at least for black economists the first black economist in this country was Sadie alexander or who how about this who earned a phd in economics was say alexander and some of her work um was on a jobs guarantee and even organizations today who 
champion her, leave that part out, right? So from the beginning of the black economists in this country, we've talked about a job guarantee. From almost the beginning of the civil rights struggle, job guarantee. We've left that part of the story out. And they're rolling back the story even more with these kind of like anti, anti-CRT anti laws. And so I think the important part is for us to, excuse me, include those stories and put those stories forward and remind people that there's something better. You know, there, there's an opportunity. There's no reason that this has to be all that there is because it hasn't always been this way. And we can look forward to something better. And so the storytelling and then the hope piece, I think, are things that we can, at least with organizing, try to fold in a little bit more. Thank you so much, all of you. The next question we have is from Michael. He says, I love Matthew's point about starting from existing institutions and networks. I'm wondering if any of you have further organization or strategy thoughts about how community organizations, mutual aid, co-ops, labor tenant unions, et cetera, prefigure the abundant world of a home slash jobs guarantee, or said differently, how democratic practice today is building the muscle for bigger democratic practice tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with everything, everything in that question, everything uh, you just read. And I think one thing I've been pointing to is that's kind of been relatively forgotten from history, especially for those of us who did not live through it, is the Comprehensive Employment Training Act of the 1970s that was basically ended by Reagan in the 1980s. This was at its height employed about 750,000 people doing public service employment, doing things like home weatherization for low income renters and low income homeowners who's, you know, for the renters, it's their landlords were never going to weatherize their homes and, you know, support their tenants in lowering their energy costs and allowing and then you know similarly for low-income homeowners this is all the sorts of work that can be done today should be done today under the auspices of a green new deal larger public service employment and i think begin pushing in a federal job guarantee direction uh, as a sort of proof of concept large-scale public service employment that needs to be do, done for social and ecological stability. And yet, you know, there's no market incentive uh, for uh, for a landlord to, to weatherize the, the, their tenant's home, uh, right? Or there's uh, not the same one that, say, there would be from an environmental justice perspective or a housing justice perspective. And so I think kind of working towards re-envisioning large scale federal governmental public service employment is essential. Similarly, you know, if you look at public sector workers, public sector workers have basically never recovered from 2008. You know, there's been no, uh, so there's also a need at the state and local level to really massively expand public sector public sector employment and i think that's that's really uh, a continue those continue to be fronts for for struggle we're not small amount to add to that with this on this question of how democratic democratic practice today is building the muscle for bigger democratic practice tomorrow bringing people together um uh for a you know, not an expert led in the traditional sense of a professional um, PhD expert, but coming together and having that space of, you know, collaborative learning, mutual learning around these structures, around these federal policies, around displacement, gentrification, all these other aspects, 
Um, I, I don't know if, if there's a better word to use a little bit more emancipatory or radical than just um, civic engagement, but that does spur the engagement of folks. I mean, like I, it's not, again, it's not just Casey Tennant's in Kansas City, it's other organizations that have been spurred on by this movement and this moment, both in 2020 and Black Lives Matter um, kind of uh, up, up um, and upsurge in 2020 and uh, late 20 and early 2021. Um, it's people are showing up and, and feeling that they can speak truth to power feeling empowered by the knowledge that they've gained working together and collaboratively and not told right that really values and centers that experience that knowledge that comes from lived experience that um those valuable you know insights that come from that lived experience with the education and the you know mutual learning around and analysis of right new analyses of um these processes of you know subordination and oppression that come from our um you know, present day federal policies and local policies. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, our next question is from Raul. He says, speaking of hard dynamics to navigate and speaking to all your points, what do we do about unions opposed to a job guarantee, especially given recent gains and wins achieved at the firm level? I mean, it's both, I don't mean this in a glib sense at all. I mean, this in a, you know, very serious sense is organize rank and file actions, organize um, kind of para trade union organizations. So I'm thinking about the, the coalition of black trade unionists has been one of the groups that really kept a demand for a job guarantee alive in the 80s and 90s and uh, uh, during a moment when it did not have the ki kind of uh, public attention and public support that it that it had in, in earlier moments and so it was groups like the coalition of black trade unionists who were uh working within this larger legacy that recognized they're both advocating for black trade unionists but also black workers broadly, and also a broader working class. And, and that's the kind of social and political commitments that groups like that can have. Similarly, I think, you know, mentioned earlier, groups like Sunrise and, and DSA, you know, there, there's a role for all those organizations to both support union members, have union members, you know, involved in, in multiple in multiple organizations, I think the more and more and more uh, organizing and organizations is is how those unions can be pressured to um, pressured into this fight um, in a, in a more sustained way and not have just just kind of narrow focus on how do we service our members in, in the most narrow sense and have a kind of broader working class agenda. Thanks, David. Do either of you have anything to add? So again, I'll follow up uh, on David just to say that, you know, I think, um, I was like, how was I going to phrase this? That having these, you know, multi, I mean, coalitions around, like, I think Sunrise does as well with, you know, environmental justice and climate activism and the job guarantee and other aspects. But I think that I've seen personally, at least in, in a you know, local's context, um, when the UAW shows up to support different housing justice organizing, organizing efforts, that there is some power in organizing around different aspects um, and sometimes coming together around that, whether it's job guarantee and homes guarantee, whether it's, you know, worker power and uh, homes guarantee, because, I mean, it's for, again, I think David very well set this out uh, in his previous work and today about how you know, we, we need these preconditions for there to be genuine civil rights. Right. We need these preconditions of economic rights. And I think that that at least in Kansas City and at least in my you know, direct experience, that that has been really powerful, um, focusing on um, understanding your housing story um, and broadening the conception of housing insecurity and injustice to not just be really framed by uh, homelessness. 
The one other thing I'd say uh, on that per kind of Jordan's comment about coalitional work is that, you know, to quote or to paraphrase the great civil rights activist, Ella Baker, if you're not kind of uncomfortable, if there's not friction within your coalition, your coalition isn't big enough, you know, so you've got to, you know, build, build big enough to have some of those moments of tension, confrontation and, and working and working together. Well, thank you very, very much, both of you, for speaking to that. Uh, now we're reaching towards the end here, and I don't see any other questions in chat. So maybe we want to go around and have any last words and let people know where we can find you and find your work. So, uh, David, start us off. Um. My last words are just, you know, thank you for, for having us and thank you for organizing this whole this whole series and this whole conference. It's a pleasure to get to speak to with with Jordan and Matthew and learn more about what you all are working on. I've considered myself just a, a fan from afar of KC Tenant. So it's really cool to hear uh, to hear about that. And and I guess the other thing would just to kind of, you know, amplify what what Jordan framed as kind of stopping 900 evictions is just incredible work and really, really, uh, you know, mind blowing and, and really incredible and points to, uh, you know, there's something that the scholar Rebecca Solnit writes about how the kind of absence of harms in our society can be difficult to see as victories without the kind of storytelling that, that Jordan is doing there. And so, you know, really, saying you know, this, this absence of those 900 evictions might look like stasis, but if you know the potential calamity that could have happened with regard to those, that, then you know how, how important that kind of, that kind of victory uh, is. Um, so that was really inspiring for me to hear about. And as far as finding me, you can find me on Twitter at David P. Stein, I think. I'm currently locked, but you know, I accept People are what I just request it, um, and then you know, yeah, my my email is, is is easily found. You know, Google David Stein civil rights or jobs, you you can find me. All right, uh, Matthew, you're up next. Um, again, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope you learned as much as as I did here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, where I spend way too much time. I have to write a dissertation on, on Twitter too much. Um, if you search uh, E40 and econometrics, that's it's me. Um, besides that, uh, jump in, right? Head first, not head first, feet first. Of Find something around you. Find an existing cause. Get in there. Do the work. There's no perfect... Um, you're going to make mistakes. It's going to be embarrassing and the cause is still going to need you. Right. And, and what you have to offer, whatever that is. And, uh, I encourage you to take those chances. And, uh, as, as it's been mentioned before, there's going to be tension and problems. Okay, man, <laughs> like, like, you know, those, those are uh, opportunities for growth. That's it. And so uh, thank you all very much. And um, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And um, yeah, if uh, Jordan can cap us off, I am actually not sure. Jordan, are you are you still here? I think he uh, might have lost connection or something. Anyways, um, we will post the links to where to find everyone in the description. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can hear you now. Cap us off, Jordan. I, yeah, I had to change devices. Just very quickly, thank you so much uh, to MMN. Thank you to Ashley for reaching out. It was such a, such a joy to be here in this conversation with David and Matthew. Um, and look forward to more conversations like this. Um, 
you can look me up, yeah, Jordan Ayala KC, Jordan A Y A L A KC on Twitter, and the same uh, same thing, J Ayala at bar.edu or my uh, my new uh, new gig, edi dot bar dot edu. Thank you so much, Jordan. Well, it was my uh, genuine pleasure to moderate this conversation today.